Okay. Very good. All right. On to subjective probability now that we've gotten through the PFMA and screening portions. All right, so the objectives of this module, we're going to define what subjective probability is, describe how to prepare for uh, subjective estimation of our probabilities, evaluate evidence to estimate these probabilities and understand ways to try to minimize bias, looking for any pitfalls in how we document the results, and then explain how to perform coherence checks on our subjective probabilities. Just as a quick note, uh, biases that are not going to be discussed in detail here. Facilitators are encouraged to read the best practices manual for a better understanding of biases and how to minimize them. Let's move this out of the way. So first off, what is a subjective probability? Um, it, it's going to be an estimate. It is the numerical value or range of values judged to be believable based upon the evidence we have available. Subjective probability estimates are typically made to represent the likelihood of each event for a potential failure mode that's been decomposed for event tree analysis. Enter is not moving the slide. All right, so why? Why do we use uh, subjective probability? So for many dam and levee safety applications, we're not going to have a lot of statistical data to work with. We're going to be evaluating conditional probabilities of events that have not been experienced or whose precursor events have not yet occurred. In addition, we're going to be evaluating probabilities for which there really are no analytical models for computing them. And as Tradogdi said, the mechanics of piping defy the theoretical approach. So. Those are the reasons that we're going to use subjective probability. So this leads to the question then, how can I estimate a probability when I don't know? Well, not knowing is going to be the essence of uncertainty. And subjective probability doesn't require us to know. It only requires us to honestly consider what we don't know and what we do know. A subjective probability estimate is going to be an expression of our state of knowledge at that moment. Anytime we have new information, it becomes available, or we have a change in our state of knowledge, then our estimated risk might need to change as well. So the matter of probability assignment can be approached from two different perspectives. We've got inductive reasoning, which is going to be a top-down approach, and it's based fundamentally on the available data and its interpretation. An inductive type of analysis answers the basic question of what happens if and the logic moves from cause to effect. Now, deductive reasoning is going to be more of a bottom-up approach of generating knowledge and the data based on you know, fundamental physics. So a deductive type of analysis is going to answer the question, how can a particular outcome come to pass? So our logic is going to move from effect to cause. Now, most engineers and scientists are going to be fairly used to deductive reasoning. Um, follow the deterministic procedure and we're going to know the answer. Um, estimating probabilities requires some inductive reasoning. We're going to have to weigh the evidence and the arguments. We're going to have to evaluate the uncertainty and estimate a number based on the information. So it requires a shift in thinking and it can be sometimes difficult for some until you have some experience. But we've had we've developed some procedures that um, that can help engineers and geologists and everybody involved out. So there are two types of information that risk assessors are going to have to synthesize when making probability estimates. We've got frequency information that deals with how often something occurs. A uh, common example of this is going to be historical failure rates. Now, anytime we're using historical failure rates, we have to use some caution because the general method in which they're developed needs to be known. The probabilities may be more represent may be more representative of several event tree probabilities and the inventory of dams or levees used to develop the rates might not be appropriate for the project that we're evaluating. So if we're going to use historical rates, we need to make sure that it applies to our situation and identify any places where it might be different or might not apply. Oops. Um, casual information or yeah, casual information is going to deal with indicators that might suggest future performance. Examples include, you know, a similar case history. Uh, analysis results, construction details, or past performance. 
So as assessors, we're going to have to be able to synthesize both of these types of information when we're making our probability estimates. Preparation and preparation is really important when we start getting into team elicitation. So for facilitators, have selecting an experienced facilitator to guide the process is going to be really important. It's it's essential. Agencies are going to have guidelines for what qualifications you need to be a facilitator, but some of the key estimate, some of the key elements are going to be listed here. Experience is very important, along with ensuring a proper team is selected for the subject matter, what type of failure mode you're evaluating. The facilitator also needs to be able to guide a diverse team through the process of estimating probabilities by trying to maintain the integrity of the process, by asking the right questions, keeping the, everybody in the group engaged, and then also critically evaluating the results for both coherence and reasonableness. Probability estimates are typically done in a team setting, and we're typically making teams of a diverse group of qualified people. The hope is that synergy is going to enhance and draw out, you know, everybody's breadth of experience and, you know, of all the real, you know, the qualified individuals that we have that are making the estimates. So team members can enter into the discussions that will allow the group to arrive at a more uh, comprehensive estimate than each individual could do so on their own. Teams shouldn't be too large because if we have too many people, it tends to get uh, bogged down, we start wasting time and recess and resources, but we also don't want it to be too small to pro to preclude appropriate interchange. So you want the right amount. Typically for a team elicitation, the core we try to do anywhere from five to six, something like that. Um, advanced preparation is going to include obtaining and reviewing as much of the original information as we possibly can related to the background and the performance of the uh, facility or structure that we're evaluating. There's often more information than you think, and you might have to look in unconventional places to find it. That could be project offices, records holding, national archives, even universities, libraries, things like that. Teams are also going to need to be familiar with any applicable frequency information, relevant case histories, available analyses, but we got to be careful of other summaries and interpretations of the original information. So make sure you get down into the nuts and bolts and the details. Now I mentioned team elicitation. This is the facilitated process to draw out or elicit a response. And in our case, this is typically going to be a, a probability estimate, but it could also be an input parameter to an analysis. The overall process can be simply described as estimate, discuss, and then if necessary, we'll estimate again. The team elicitation is going to be a facilitated process to draw out or elicit a response. So potential failure modes must be clearly defined from initiation uh, to failure or breach, which we just went through an exercise going through how to do that. And then that full sequence of events is decomposed into events that constitute an event tree. Therefore, it's the blueprint for the risk analysis. Decomposition is also key to making sure that the estimates are within well-calibrated range, and I'm going to get to that range a little later in the presentation. Um, a clear and unambiguous description of the event probability to be estimated needs to be written down because we need to make sure that all uh, participants and estimators are all on the same page. We need to be estimating the same thing. It's helpful to start sometimes with a generic event tree for the failure mode that you're looking at. And when we use these common event trees, we can typically get more consistency. And then the best met practices manual it will include such examples. They're kind of intended to be a starting point. And if we've got um, specific conditions that we need to evaluate, we can always adapt and um, deviate from those common event trees to fit our scenario. So again, Describing the event, we need a clear and unambiguous description of the event probability to be estimated. We need the entire team to be on the same page. While this may not be put on the event tree, the description needs to be captured somewhere. So in this example, um, an event is described as or pressures rise, for example. Now, will all team members interpret this the same based on the description? 
where do the pore pressures rise, by how much, what are the possible outcomes given the rise occurs. These are all things that we need to be clear about and discuss to make sure that we're evaluating the same thing. Evidence making an event more likely and less likely, it needs to be thoroughly identified and correct and collected. This is typically done in a two column table format for each event or node in the event tree. So when we're estimating probabilities, not all estimates, not all evidence that we're considering are going to be given equal weight or any weight for that matter. We need to be careful of hearsay evidence and seek out cooperating information. And really we need to be as objective as we possibly can with estimates and make the best estimate, not a conservative estimate. And because we're, we're dealing with some significant investments that are involved when we're talking about remediation and repair. So we need to clearly document the evidence that we have so that someone who was not at the meeting could pick up this, you know, the report years later and understand what the team was thinking. So documentation is really important. All final probabilities are estimated using team elicitation procedures based upon the totality and the strength of the evidence. So in most cases, the evidence will be more heavily weighed to one side or the other. But one factor may be given a whole lot more weight than a large number of factors on the other side. So in the example I've got here, the first statement um, related to the turbid water is pretty strong and raises the possibility that internal erosion initiated at some reservoir level. However, as you can see from the questions raised at the bottom, it could carry very little weight until it's confirmed and the questions are answered. So answering these types of questions can help a team decide which arguments are the strongest and which should carry the most weight. So here's an example of the two column table format for more likely and less likely factors. This is an example for an event involving initiation of internal erosion through an embankment dam abutment into a drainage tunnel. Now we can take the key factors and we can bold them. Um, similar tables are prepared for each event or node of the event tree. Now, the probability of some event outcomes cannot be calculated or determined from statistical data. In this case, it's necessary to estimate probabilities judgmentally. So for some people, estimating numerical probabilities doesn't come very naturally, and it's often helpful to have some tools to help aid in the effort. So on this slide, we've got one of these tools. It's a verbal probability mapping scheme. There was a psychology experiment that asked people to describe the probability of known events using everyday words. And those are the words that are shown in the left-hand column. The results from the experiment showed that most people were pretty well calibrated between values of 0.01 and 0.99. So anywhere from 1% to 99%. And those are showed by the, um, the values in the right-hand column. And they're reporting there the median and the range of the estimates shown. So we use a modified version of that to capture the potential for a larger range of estimates due to the possibility of more certainty in some estimates. For example, the probability that concrete is saturated and cracked. Although you should consider decomposing failure modes further if you tend to make a lot of virtually impossible estimates, um, a separate node for the concrete is saturated and the concrete is cracked, if that can make sense in an event sequence. You guys following? So if we have you know, certain things that we think are going to have a super low probability, it's better to split those up into separate events if you can. Now, in estimating probabilities, it's not a time to go very fast. We want the case to stand up to the scrutiny of a diverse group of reviewers. So making sure that we have the correct amount of discussion and maintain the integrity of the process is important. Really, it's crucial. Um, each team member should make an initial probability estimate completely on their own before having heard any other's estimates. So this helps to avoid the bandwagon effect or any kind of anchoring bias. And anchoring bias is just following the opinion of the smartest looking person or the loudest person in the room. And really we wanna force each team member to think about it on their own critically, looking at the evidence, the likelihood of each event. So. Each team member is asked to do it alone, and then 
you know, reveal their estimate. Following the initial anonymous round of estimating, there's going to be a discussion of the results. So this open discussion encourages the group interaction, provides insight to different interpretations, and really improves the overall understanding. And to me, this is really what it's all about. The probability estimates may all clump together, maybe around some common value. They might vary widely. They might, um, you might have one or two outliers. Again, the discussion is critical, especially if the estimates are spread over a wide range or if there are outliers. The facilitator is going to call upon representatives of the differing groups. You know, maybe he'll call it, he or she will call it whoever had the highest value, the lowest value, someone in the middle. And they're going to be asked to explain why they held a particular belief in light of the evidence that everybody reviewed. And then this could in, hopefully generate additional discussion and um, analysis and thought. So once we have you know, that initial round of probability estimates, agreement between the estimators might indicate that everyone is interpreting the information in the exact same way. If we have a huge scatter and disagreement, it might indicate a poorly defined event. So adjustments to the event description to make it more clear or further decomposition into additional events might be necessary. Disagreement might also indicate that some estimators are mistaken about the importance of particular evidence, or maybe they hold different views in the mind about, you know, geologic models or design or construction details or what have you. So some estimators might have a totally different interpretation of the data or expected performance. It's important to understand why they have that particular belief. The rest of the team might need to adjust their estimates if they're persuaded by the discussion. Or maybe the outlier may have misinterpreted the evidence and changed their probability. So in most cases, following the discussion, we can usually reach some kind of consensus. The median value of the team is usually a good place to start for consensus. The median is the measure of the central tendency of a small data set whereas the mean or the average can be unreasonably skewed by one estimate. Now, not every single estimate needs to be captured by the uncertainty range. If the team cannot come to a consensus, it'll, it'll be necessary to carry out both or multiple estimates through the event tree and documenting the reasons for both. So kind of seeing how sensitive the end result would be um, to those two different probabilities. Uh, last point here would be do, we don't want to use the range of the, that the team estimated to form a distribution for input into a Monte Carlo analysis. So if a distribution is required, uh, we're going to use the methods that I'm going to describe in the next couple slides. Um, I'll add one thing on consensus. While consensus is nice, it's not necessarily the goal. Sometimes when you get into the room, you see people that you know, will change their probabilities just to become like everybody else and, you know, to move on to the next thing. If you have a specific reason for the probability that you estimated it, you know, that needs to be communicated, that needs to be captured. We're all trying to do the best that we can. And really the discussion that comes from it is the most important thing. So the estimation process is applied to estimating the most likely probability and the tails when we start looking at distributions, low and high values, and we're gonna get the median value of each. Um, we're gonna remember to elicit, discuss, and settle on a consensus value before going on to the next question. Although often all questions or just the bounds can be elicited at the same time, but discussed individually. Now, if there's, a, if there's no reason to believe that um, our particular probability is more likely to be between a high and low value, we've got a range set, then we might want to use a uniform distribution. Uh, and that's going to give us basically a equal likelihood between being those bounds. Now, for most elicitations, we're going to use a triangular distribution where we have a high set as our maximum, a low as our minimum, and then a best estimate as our mode, which we'll show here. I know um, um, Dave Margo talked about the PERT distribution as well. The one thing I'll say about the PERT distribution that makes it a little challenging is you really have to get the low bound 
and the high bound. It's a good thing, you know, you can get a, um, a decent look at, it's a decent um, probability distribution for, I guess, getting at what your midpoint is because it's gonna weight your median more heavily than the tails, but getting those ranges are kind of tough. So a lot of times we'll default to the triangular distribution. All right, so in terms of documenting the results of the team elicitation, we have to build a case for each probability estimate and highlight the key pieces of the evidence. So there have been teams in the past that have misused and misunderstood the practice of highlighting or bolding key factors. Um, a common example is when you highlight multiple factors on both the more and less likely side and then make an estimate that's obviously weighted one way or the other with no other explanation. That does the reviewer no good. So the highlighted factor should only be the key factors that drove the estimate. When multiple factors are highlighted, there needs to be some explanation of how the team weighed the evidence and why. If the team cannot come to a consensus, both or multiple estimates can be carried through the event tree along with the rationale to de demonstrate the sensitivity of the results for each on the safety case and the path forward. If it matters, this usually leads to recommendations for additional investigation with the attempt to improve the understanding and hopefully reduce uncertainty. And then after the team elicitations are made, it is essential to perform coherence checks to make sure that the event tree rules were not violated, to make sure that the probabilities that were estimated are monotonically increasing, and really just to get an overall gut check making sure that everything that we've estimated lines up with the evidence that we considered. We typically do this after each uh, potential failure mode is completely estimated, and then again after all the potential failure modes are estimated. After each failure mode is estimated, we like to plot the system response curve to review its shape, make sure the inflection points make sense, and then plot the risk for the failure mode on the little fn chart to see if the re overall results make sense. And then after all the failure modes are estimated, uh, we'll plot the results on the same chart to see if the overall results for the facility make sense. Any questions? Questions for Damon on subjective probabilities. <laughs> 